Hi everybody. So tonight I'm going to eat some licorice and read this uh, short mystery story. Um, I haven't read it yet, but it's supposed to be good, so hopefully it is. It's called Things That Follow by Jim Allen. Four men were clustered around the form on the stainless steel autopsy table. Two in dark blue uniforms, a homicide detective in a plain dark suit, and the medical examiner in a knee-length white lab coat. The room was cool, sterile, gleaming metal and white plastic. Latex gloves and various instruments of invasion were carefully laid out. A Mr. Co <laughs> a Mr. Coffee was perking happily in the corner. and honor guard to what he had said, the kind of innocence that if any of them had ever had, had it had long since been ground away. I butchered that sentence, but yeah, we'll continue. up 
a magical apple pie American small town where everyone's friend and where everyone's a friend and beautiful teenage girls are never disemboweled by vicious freaks. <laughs> they knew no such so uh, they knew no such town existed, but they weren't sure Joey did. An awkward silence. Carmen broke it. Hank, I asked you to stop by because she was found near the area in Campbell where you've been working. You seen her before? If I did, it probably would have been in front of a club, Hank said. He stepped in closer and studied her face. Hank was accustomed to seeing it dead. He'd seen more night rag in an afternoon than he'd seen during his entire time in the force. He was beyond shocking, but not beyond anything else. She looked surprised, young and surprised for the last time. It was not a flashback, not a disorienting dis disabling, disabling episode. Those were pretty much behind him now. It was a remnant of Iraq, nonetheless. Something in the shape of the girl's sad lips that reminded him of the slain matriarch. A powerful memory that took him back. inside the home. The bodies of the Sunni family were lying awkwardly on the floor, twisted and splayed by the bolts that had killed them. Hank was standing alone, black rifle over his shoulder, surveying, surveilling the silent scene, when a tall, crusty major, a fellow marine, entered the oldest looking soldier he had ever seen. The major stood next to Hank for what seemed like a great while. Together they stared at the bodies. In the middle of the car, two children were embracing at this, their last moment. Whoever had paid this fatricidal visit, whatever faction or militia, or perhaps even the Mahdi army, they had gunned them down at their evening meal, creating this contorted fatal ring. Blood everywhere, food and shards of bowls and glasses everywhere. Colors and textures splayed across sick clothing and faces. The faces were those of individuals, young and old. Their expressions, all different, burned to Hank's memory. His eyes rested and became on the face of the matriarch he had spoken to and warned the day before. She was the wife and mother and grandmother, even in death was a force in the room. The one who was close to them all had helped them all, had been there for each of them in many different ways. The one who bore the weight. Suddenly the dead woman's head jerked slightly and a faint sound had escaped her lips. Hank took a clumsy half step forward. The Major blocked him with an arm. Some kind of death rattle, he said. The weight of the body pushes out gas. There's nothing we can do. We've been telling him to clear up for weeks, the Major went on gruffly. We warned them. We told him to leave. We told him it was dangerous. Yes, sir, Hank said. If he had learned one thing in the Corps, it was that Corporals don't question Majors. That's true. But he felt compelled to speak anyway. What if we never have liberated this family, Major? Think they'd be any worse off? The Major glanced sharply at Hank. His face tightened, then instantly relaxed, and he shrugged. Well, Corporal, there's that, isn't there? There's always that. A long moment went by. Where are you from, soldier? The Major. Okay, the Major in the Marine Corps wouldn't ask, where are you from, soldier? Because Marines aren't soldiers. Desert wind came through an open window and brushed his face with a 
faint scent of death. The major put his hand gently on Hank's shoulder. Son, he said, no matter where your travels take you from here, become an astronaut and fire the moon. You'll never be any further away from home than you are right now.
Hank shifted uncomfortably in his chair. He was six foot three and stocky and easily overwhelmed the standard office chair. He had something to say to Assistant Chief Butch Johnson about Jory Sheridan, and he really didn't want to. If you could draw a soldier, square shoulder, square jaw, determined bearing, sandy hair cut short on the sides, that soldier would look like Hank Sawyer. Butch Johnson was a darker, shorter, denser version. A dark green marine. Butch was the informal leader of the informal Marine Corps Mafia within the South Bend PD. All the ex-Marines who never really considered themselves ex, mostly veterans of Afghanistan and Iraq. They were a close-knit group who hung together and helped each other out. Butch was a busy man. Hank was sure he would consider his concern petty. He hoped he would be wrong. Among themselves, the Marine Corps Mafia expressed serious doubt about Joey Sheridan. Like Hake, this group of veterans had seen plenty of combat. Yes, it was a war, but killing is killing. And if the moment ever came, they weren't sure Joey Sheridan would be up to the task. And none of them wanted to partner with him, including Hank. Okay, let's have it, Butch said, recognizing Hank's reluctance to speak. I'm not comfortable with the guy. What guy? Joey Sheridan. Butch groaned. Oh, here we go again. Take a good reason to mess around with... Takes a good reason to mess around with assignments, Hank. You know that? I don't want to work with him. Why? Instinct. Oh, well. No problem. There's a reason that we'll breathe right on through. Joey's okay, Hank. He's been through the same in-depth interviews and foolproof psyche fells that we all have. They both laughed. Look, this is not a small thing. It's going to irritate people for no apparent reason. No apparent reason. You hear about the pool? That's a bunch of crap, which snaps stupid waste of time. Hank brought intensity, focus, and seriousness of purpose to any job of work. This Joey thing was a job of work to Hank because otherwise he wouldn't even brought it up, and Butch knew he wasn't going to let it go. I can't mess with assignments on your personal whim. You kidding me? You want me to give you a choice of air fresheners for your brawler while I'm at him? Collect cinnamon spice or wildflowers. It's not a whim, Hank said flatly. I've learned the hard way not to ignore my gut. I trust my own intent in some situation, and this is one. I don't want to be a pain in the ass, but this guy's trouble. Unreliable. So I'm asking. Let me guess, Butch said, because he comes from PR. He snorted. You're worried about being with Joey in a shaky situation. Well, welcome to the world, pal. Nobody's reliable until they prove it, and you know it. Nothing counts except the real deal, and you can't simulate that. He didn't know how to push Bush, and anyway, he didn't want to be pushy, so he just sat staring into space. Give me something, Butch said. Hank was silent. That's what I thought, Butch said. Carmen's half-assed tough guy test, Butch said. Big deal. 
well look best i can do is switch you out maybe a month or two something will open up always does don't bitch to anybody just suck it up and keep your mouth shut won't do a damn bit of good to have joe and the others know you think he's shaky and if you ask me it's kind of sad that we're talking about somebody maybe being a bad cop because he might be too nice i'll move in a way that won't reflect Sally. 
in her warm robe, her cigarette, her chipped white cup. Traces of the smooth, forgotten contours of youth were still visible in her weathered face. He could imagine her young, pretty, laughing, full of promise, and she had once been. He used to be brusque with older women and never had time for them. He wasn't like that anymore. Sally Sanchez reminded him of the moms and grandmothers he sat with in Iraq on the floor, on the floor trying to gather information, get support, or give them advice. Like, get the hell out of her before you and your kids get shot or blown up. But they had nowhere to go. They had seen the sprawling squalor of refugee camps that stretched to the horizon. And Sally didn't have anywhere to go either. She was stuck with her chipped white cup and a sun gone bad. It seemed to Hank that sun's gone bad were a staple of female existence, regardless of oceans or religions or race. You were alone last time I was here, Hank said. Congratulations. Oh. Sally tossed her head toward the living room. Right, my lover boy, she said in disdain. I thought I'd find my soulmate. That's all I've been looking for, really. Someone to be with me. Love him, you know. She gave it the white cup, but he drinks. And when he drinks, he's different. Mean. Oh. Never know one like that. Lots of things said. Except for my work and half my family. Yes, I thought I found my soulmate. She went on. God, we get along so great. There was a lost passion beneath that aging smoker's skin. A tiny pink bow held her. Bow held her thinning ponytail in place. He thought she must have been really something when she was 18. I get so angry, I mean. Really, you told me it's me and you, baby, all the way. And I believed him. Then he turns out to be mean. How long have you known him? Three or four months, I guess. So is he roughing you up? I can have a talk with him. She turned furious eyes on him, her voice rising shrill. He's not rough me, I never said that. Roy loves me. Oh, oh, sorry. I mean, you said he was mean when he drank, I just assumed. No, he isn't mean that way. He watches TV. Watches TV. Yeah, he comes home from work, pours himself one big drink, plops on the floor, and lays there watching TV every night like clockwork. He'll, slow, he'll sip that drink till bedtime. He watches whatever doesn't matter movies, wrestling, war scandals. Sometimes, sometimes I call to him, but he just stays there. Does he ever drink more than that? No. Oh, on Saturdays, he might have two. Doesn't drink on Sunday, says the Lord. Doesn't like it. Like the Lord gives a damn about him having a drink or something. Drop him. Sometimes he goes for hours without saying a word to me. And I was fresh in love and all. Her voice trailed off. It's natural for things to slow down, I said. Gently. I'm sure it'll be okay, Sally. He waved his car and laid on the table. Now listen, if Mitch shows up or contacts you, please call me. He's in deep this time, but we can help him. He's gonna have to do time, but he's gonna have to take the fall for all of it. If you're not careful, that SWAT team will show up, go cowboy, and Mitch will get hurt. It doesn't have to be that way. Together, we can keep him from getting hurt. She smiled at him warmly, lighting another cigarette, and he smiled back, indicating without words that they both knew Mitch would come here. However, briefly, and that she would not contact Hank under any circumstances. Pro forma visit over both parties. From the kitchen, Hank moved into the main, the man cave television gloom. Joey was standing straight, restlessly chewing away at a toothpick, arms folded across his chest, wired and bored. Who's this thing, guest? Tigers and Indians, said Loverboy Roy, a big man lying in the forest, his chin on a pillow, and a small black cat comfortably curled in the small of his back. Tigers have talent, but only use it when it doesn't matter, he said. They're like Mitch. Night was here, and they were sitting in the worst car in a motor pool. A beat-up slime green 2010 on a Civic. It blended nicely with the neighborhood. The only new cars here were just passing through. Plus, they were likely going to sit here all night, so the fact that the Honda might look abandoned didn't hurt. On blocks with no tires or sitting on flat tires, useless cars were as common as on mown lawns. Of the assignments on Butch's sheet, str you know, sheet, this day 
cut was the least likely to yield results to bring the kind of action that Hank was worried about. They had found a narrow, empty lot between two small repair shops. Between the two buildings and from the back of the lot, they would be in shadows. And had an angled look at the dismal ranch of Sally Sanchez, enough to see the front and side doors. You first, or me, Hank said. Go ahead, catch some seas, seas, Joey said. I haven't done anything all day, and I'm not tired. Talk me into it, Hank said, sliding out on the scene. As he dozed off, he knew he wouldn't dream about 4,000 pound offies doing cartwheels with air, although he'd seen that. He wouldn't dream about buildings turned into hollow eyed skeletons, although he'd seen plenty of those. He would dream about the Sunni family. His dream was an imagined prequel of something he hadn't actually seen. Those about to be slaughtered were at dinner, chatting, happy, eating safe. When hooded, shouting, shadowy figures burst into the room. Bolts were sprayed wildly and the noise was deafening. Family members toppled into the positions that he and the Major had come upon. And all through the lethal chaos, the matriarch with the sad, dead face struggled to shield the children until she too was among the fallen. Wow, you call that sleep? You were like a beagle dreaming about rabbits, yipping legs jerking. Joey handed the binoculars to Hank. See that cat asleep in the window? With the binos, a thin black shape at the base of the window turned out to be a black cat stretched out between the window and the stained pearl colored curtains, which were tightly closed. Yeah, it's not dead to the world. It's dead, period. And just how do you know that? We've been here almost three hours. It hasn't budged. Interesting, but so what? So we should check it out, Joey said eagerly. One of us sneak up to the window, see if it's breathing. Why would we do that? Because if it's dead, it's probably because for it's probable cause for entry. If we can get in there, Mitch is probably lying on the couch drinking a beer and watching the tube. Probable cause? Baloney, how do you figure that? Should be good enough for a good lord to get something to fly, Joey said. We're on a legitimate stakeout, so we have a legitimate reason for watching the place. We see a dead cat in the window. We know it's dead because we checked it out. It means the person inside can properly tend to it, can't properly tend to it, so they may be in trouble. One of those I phone at the tub and I can't get out to feed the cat kind of deals. So we're going in to help. Oh, I don't know. By the way, there's Mitch. Sorry, excuse me. Or maybe even the animal cruelty abandonment, maybe. That cat in the window isn't exactly ideal care. Isn't exactly business as usual. What I'm saying is a good lawyer can work with something like that. Say what he was thinking, because I thought it might spur Joey on. That there was an extremely slim chance of the right combination of Lincoln and that lawyer, and judge just might wave the warrant. But I didn't think it could ever survive an appeal. Just too thin. Never fly, he said. The exigent circumstance. I don't know what that word is. Exigent, maybe I don't know. Sounds right. Need exigent circumstance for warrantless entry, and the more exigent, the better. Think gunshots, think screams, think smoke from the roof. Even if the cat is dead, it's not an emergency. Anything we'll get will be tainted and tossed. I tell you what, let's check our free line friend. I'm gonna put the glasses on him for five minutes. Tommy Hank tightened the focus on the cat. He could see it pretty well with the faint rays from the streetlight. Time, Joey said. Hank can see no movement. You might be right, he said. Okay, so we knock on the door and announce ourselves. I just want them to just want to let them know there's a dead cat in the window and waltz in, uh, waltz on into the house. Jesus, Joey, don't just waltz into a house. A dead cat in the window doesn't make for a failed search. They'd have no reason to let us wander around the house for that, and a judge would know it. Just let it go, will you? Relax. This is a stakeout. We're just looking for Mitch, or at least someone we can claim as Mitch to be going in and out. A dead cat in the window isn't in business as usual, Joyce firmly. We can use it. We can use it to get our ass chewed off for illegal entry. Hank stretched to look rocky from his restless sleep. You could see Joey's worked up. First time he'd seen that. Just lost my place.
eyes. Um, he decided to try to placate him. No one was in charge here. There were temporary partners in the fact that Hank was senior didn't matter. Look, if it's not dead, it's a moot point, right? So I'll go to the window up close and personal and see who it's what. If anyone comes out or approaches the place, we give them one quick peep on the horn. Don't use the radio. Works for me too. I said it's satisfied for the moment to be doing anything but just sitting. In the brutal moonlight, there was a snap to the early morning air. Saying moved along the side of the side of one of the low industrial buildings, then walked briskly in the open right up to the window. Calf's mouth was open slightly, a bit of its pink tongue protruding. Hank rubbed his finger on the window and then tapped lightly. Something only a cat would hear. Nothing. He watched the ribcage. The ribcage was not moving. The cat sure looked dead. Damn. Hank returned to the Honda. How come you kept looking up when you're going over there, Joey asked? Did I? Rooftops, I guess, just a habit. They're great for snipers and for phoning in IEDs. That's, that's not much of a problem in South Bend. I didn't get the habit in South Bend, Hank said. So, so it looks dead to me, but it's a lame ass reason to rouse the place, and if someone does happen, and if something does happen, it's going to be a mess trying to make it stick, and okay, maybe it's boring as hell, but we just have to sit here and do our job. Joey shifted his seat and looked directly at Hank. Hank had the feeling of looking a strange dog in the eye and having no idea what it might do. Might lick your hand, might bite it off. It's not growling or showing its teeth, but you're very much worth it. You really don't know the animal. It's enough to go in, Joey said mildly. I want to do it. So throw it out somewhat. Maybe we get the guy, maybe we don't. So what? Look, we're partners, Hank said. We're supposed to agree on the course of action. Fine, you can be my partner sitting there in the car doing nothing, and I'll be your partner going into that house. You know I can't do that. I have to back you we have to call it in. Then do it. Call it in and back me up, Joey said out of the Honda. Hank was startled. Joe was just going to go ahead and do it. He had to decide to confront him or what. Okay to keep the peace and follow Butcher's advice, he would allow himself to look silly back at the ranch. Half assed or not, they would at least look like they were cooperating and trying to do their job. He didn't know what confronting Joey might lead to, but it wouldn't be anything good. Hank got out of the car and grabbed Joey by both shoulders, squaring, squaring him up in front of him. I can't call it in because I don't know what the hell I'd say, Hank said. If it's necessary, we'll just say we thought the other guy called it in. This isn't a lark, he said firmly. Anything could happen, so we're gonna do it, right? First, let's see what we can see what we can through the windows and check the layout. Then we'll figure out the next step. And just for the record, if there's an ex oh. exigent circumstance around here, it's Butch sticking me with your sorry ass. Sure thing, Joey said, what did you say? It was clear that angry Hank did not bother him. white t-shirt decorated with four dark smudges of bullet holes. 
Haig didn't bother to check for a pulse. He pointed to himself in the kitchen doorway on the left. He would check that out. He motioned for Joey to check down the hallway. With his gun up and ready, Hank moved to the open archway. Bathed in the stark light of a single bulb, Sally Sanchez was sitting at the kitchen table, wearing the same light blue, threadbare cotton robe, a cup of coffee before her, and a golden brown pint of Seagram's VL. A little black brown Inc. 25 auto about the size of a deck of cards was a few inches from her right hand. She turned her head to look at Hank. Sally, please don't move, Hank said softly. Want to tell me what happened? His gun was at the table level, pointing at her body. I really loved him, you know. So you said, uh, I remember. Joey appeared in the doorway on the other side of the kitchen. He shook his head, indicating that no one was in the back of the house. He aimed his clock directly at Sally, who didn't even notice. Her focus was entirely on Hank. I got so angry, Sally joked. I mean, I really thought it was my soulmate. I didn't want to hurt him, but he was so mean. I'm sure people understand, Sally. Don't you tell him he was beating me. He never did that. Roy loved me. I won't tell anybody anything, Hank said. Sally, you're going to have to come with us. She didn't move. Hank hesitated. He didn't believe there was any danger. His sense of it was that the violence was over, drained away. He looked into her eyes and saw pain in that aging face and the pain of other faces. And he saw so much that pointing a gun at her was something he just couldn't do. Look, Sally, Hank said, gently, slowly, and deliberately holstering the clock. Joey's eyes widened. At the very moment of that de escalating gesture, Sally smiled ever so slightly, and that little smile curled into a snarl of sheer menace. A frightening, twisted face that jolted Hank. As he knew, he saw this was how she looked when she shot her lover boy Roy four times. She lunged for her browning. Joey's aim was fixed on Sally's heart when she launched for her gun, but he not fired. Instead, he took a quick half step and launched himself across the kitchen. He hurled himself through the air for several feet and crashed on the wooden table, collapsing everything, dumping Sally to the floor and anointing, anointing the room with a mixture of secrets and coffee. The little black automatic skittered across the hole and only him to the other side of the room. Joey's face was buried in Sally's warm, soft chest, a rope reeking of cheap perfume and sour sweat, old booze and old smoke. She was motionless. That damn Roy she slurred into his neck, her eyes closed. Joey got to his feet, his pant leg was torn, and he had a small cut on his half on his calf from the sawtooth thatch of a broken table leg. He knelt and shifted Sally to a more natural position there on the floor. He eased her limp arms around her back and cuffed her. He turned to face Hank, who was standing stock still, glued to the same spot. His clock was still holstered. She's out of Hank, Joey said, probably half drunk and half cold cocked. We've got to call this in, like, right now. You call it in, Hank said. What do you want me to say? Use your own judgment, Hank said. Whatever you say will be okay with me. I need a moment. I'm going to go get the car. Hank walked through the cool night air. Lost in thought. He was shaken. He couldn't believe what he had done. He felt like he had been... He felt like he should... He felt like he should be slapped around and kicked up and down the street. So stupid, he muttered in disgust. He realized that wherever he had been mentally, it was sufficiently dysfunctional that he wouldn't have reacted fast enough to prevent Sally from getting that gun. But he was a learner. He believed he knew what prompted the dangerous move. A type of thinking had caused him to do something that was potentially deadly. He wouldn't go there again. He would see it coming. He pulled the Honda well off to the side of the road gravel driveway. Broad gravel driveway. <laughs> Leaving plenty of space for the two prowlers in the ambulance that were quickly on the scene. He watched as officers and paramedics entered the ranch. They brought Sally out on a stretcher and loaded her in. Joey came out with them, said something to them, and then walked over to the Honda and stood by the open window. The skinny black, the skinny black cat was in his arms. He was alert and seemed to like him. Old, Joey said, shallow breather, deaf. What did you report? Hank said. Asked. I told them we heard shots. Joey said that's why we went in. Couldn't tell how many because they were all muffled. We heard shots and went in. Fast. I didn't mention the cat. Didn't want to screw around with that in a murder case. I 
said Sally was standing in the kitchen with the gun at her side and I tackled her as soon as we came in. Didn't tell him about you holstering your gun. Didn't want to screw around with that either. And that's not something you want in your record, so that's it. Everything happened in a couple minutes, really fast. If Sally contradicts anything, well, she was drunk, wasn't she? How's that sound? Hey, not an approval. That's damn good. It will save us a lot of explaining and not hurt a thing. Typical stack over your shots, beat feet to the house, bust the door, and you tackle her as soon as we come in. That was one hell of a body block, by the way. No hesitation. Gotta be one of the fastest moves I ever saw. But you should have dropped her, you know. A bullet is her sure thing. A tackle, not so much. You risk both our lives. Joey laughs off while you're talking to me about risk. The guy who holds her gun in front of an armed murder suspect. She was in my sights. I could have popped her, no problem. was following your lead. You were trying to finesse her, okay? I get that. You saw something or that it wasn't there or maybe missed something that was. People make mistakes like that every minute of every day. With your record, you get a mulligan. But I'll tell you what, I wouldn't do that again, even if the person with the gun is the Virgin Mary. It never happened before and won't be back, I think said. But he wasn't all that sure. Sometimes things that follow catch up. Here's how I see it, Joey said. There was a shooting here tonight and someone got killed. We handled the situation without shooting, without killing. I figured that's the best we can do. We get paid to take chances, and the chances we took tonight were the best kind. We tried to save a life. Sally is still breathing, and who knows? Maybe she'll have got her cure for cancer and the slammer. More like she'll knife a guard, Hank said. Joey left. Yeah, you're probably right. Anyway, our first order of business is finding a good home for this old guy. I'd say his support system was pretty much wiped out tonight. Hank looked for Joey, staring there with the cat asleep in his arms. He was perfectly calm, one face by the night's events. Hank realized that if he had not followed Joey's lead, they would still be across the street in the hut, deciding where to go and where to go to get morning coffee. Just another uneventful stakeout. And then when someone else had to handle the situation with Sally, maybe something terrible goes down and she kills someone else or gets herself killed or both. If they had killed Sally, the mood of this moment would be very different. Trying to get to sleep this night would be very different. Hank believed every cop in the department it would have shot Sally Sanchez when she went for that gun. Every cop but one. It slowly came to him, almost as an epiphany that he was looking at his next partner. It would take some time to work, but it would work. Paper will put up anything printed on, so said Joseph Stalin. I don't generally turn to Stalin for inspiration, but if... Oh, sorry, that was the end of the story. I guess, I, I don't know, I... Hopefully you enjoyed. Uh, I don't know if you, my reading skills aren't great, but uh, hopefully it was okay. So thanks for watching.